This whole business of financing the war is very complicated and boring in many ways, but really important. The government basically was bankrupt by the end of 1861. Uh, up to that point, they were, the government's income basically came from either selling Western land or a very, very low tariff on imported goods. So the first thing they do is start issuing bonds, that is to say, borrowing money. You, you sell these bonds which people buy and then they're paid back down the road with interest. Um, they're sold to banks, they're sold to big investors, and they have a very high interest rate. The interest rate is like 7.5%, which is very high back then, and they have, that will increase considerably the long-range cost of the war, but you have to make it attractive for people to buy these bonds. But, even, but then they couldn't sell enough, and by the end of 1861, the government is bust. It has, doesn't have enough money. The only thing it can do, as I mentioned last time, is issue legal tender paper money. Paper money that, mu that is, must be accepted as currency by everyone in the country. Now, before the Civil War, there was no national currency. Banks issued paper money. All sorts of different banks printed money. Nobody knew if they were worth anything or not. You had to decide for yourself. Uh, if I try to pay you with a $50 bill issued by the Bank of Topeka, Kansas, I don't know, is that bank? Supposedly, all that paper money is backed by gold, right? The only real money is gold and silver, what they call hard money. But you can't really carry gold and silver around. It's kind of heavy. So um, paper money represents it. In other words, if, I, if you give me a $50 bill from the Bank of Topeka, and then I go out to Topeka and hand it in, I can say, give me my $50 worth of gold. And the bank is supposed to do that. Now, of course, they don't think a lot of people are going to turn up, so they issue a lot more paper money than they have gold. Uh, if they can't pay, they just, this is a phrase one finds in the literature, they suspend specie payments. That is say, well, I'm sorry, we can't give any gold now. Maybe we'll get some down the road. But in other words, I'm not going to accept that money if I don't think that bank is worth anything. So there's no legal tender. There's no requirement for me to accept the money that someone is offering to pay me. But there, so this is not the way you can finance a, um, a modern war. Um, but it's based on a deep, deep moral sentiment that the only real money is gold and silver and that paper money is not just bad but immoral. It is immoral to issue paper money. It's like a lie. It's giving you something that has no value. S the chairman, Fessenden, the senator from Maine, who's ch chairman of the House Senate Committee on Finance, says, he says, I have a moral dilemma. The legal tender clause is opposed to all my views of right and expediency. It shocks my notions of moral, political, and national honor. It's dishonorable to issue paper money. But without it, we will be utterly bankrupt. So he approves it, and the federal government issues the first money issued by the government in American history. Not by local banks, by the federal, the so-called greenbacks. And they are they must be accepted, and that, that's a lot of how they finance the war. Now, there's a little bit of a problem, though. Some people don't want these greenbacks, particularly people who are buying federal bonds. So the, the greenbacks are used to pay soldiers their wages. They're used for the government to buy things. But the interest on the national bonds is to be paid in gold, not greenbacks. In other words, there's one currency for the bankers, and one currency for everybody else. This is so that they will get these banks to buy large amounts of national bonds by promising to pay them in, uh, pay the interest down the road in gold because paper money deteriorates in value. It causes inflation and therefore the money is worth less and less as prices go up. And so there's this kind of uh, a dual currency but um, by 1865, almost $500 million, quite a lot back then, of greenbacks, of paper money by the federal government is issued to help pay for the war. Um, and this is, again, part of the centralization. The, the national, issuing money is a major 
exercise of sovereign power, right? The government issues the money, but they hadn't done that before the Civil War. Now this is something that a modern national state does. Um, but this is just one part of a giant financial picture. The North, more than the South, also institutes an enormous number of taxes. And again, before the war, there was no tax, federal tax, except the tariff, which was low and almost nobody paid it. Now everything is taxed, you name it. Excise taxes, cons every kind of consumer good is taxed. Um, whiskey is taxed. That becomes the source of a great scandal of the Grant administration, the whiskey rings, where officials are conniving with whiskey companies to avoid uh, paying the taxes. Um, stamp taxes, manufacturing taxes, occupation taxes, to follow any kind of occupation you had to pay a tax. And of course, the first income tax in American history, starting at 3% of the annual income of people above a certain uh, income level. Um, all these taxes lead to a lot of annoyance because people don't like to pay taxes, as you're well aware. But they also, again, they create the financial basis for a national state. The income tax is repealed after, after um, the Civil War. Many of these other taxes disappear. But a lot of them stick around. Never again will the tariff be bring in 90% of government revenue as it did before the war. Now you have a much more expanded tax base, which gives the government a lot more flexibility in how it raises money and how it therefore can spend money. So again, and taxes bring your average citizen into direct contact with the government. Everyone now has to pay money to the government, which wasn't true before the uh, Civil War. And then the final and really important, especially in this town, uh, financial measure is the National Banking Act. National Banking Act. 1863 and another one in 1864 to create a system of what is a national bank? It's a bank whose charter, whose corporate charter, is issued by the federal government. There had only been one in history, and that was the Bank of the United States, which became a big issue in the Jacksonian era. But that went out of existence in the 1830s. Now any bank can get a federal charter, and you know they call it the, the first national bank of Cincinnati or the third national bank of Portland, Maine, or whatever. But what do you got to do to become a national bank? You have to promise to buy an enormous amount of national bonds. The national banking system is another way to raise money for the federal government. You must spend an enormous amount of money on federal bonds, that is, loaning money to the federal government. Well, why should you do that? What's the value, what's the use of being a national bank rather than a state bank? Most banks are chartered by individual states. And in fact, a lot of banks say, oh, well, who cares, national, state, we're not going to, why should we pay all that money? We're not going to try to do it. So in, or, in order to, um, I think in, in early 1865, in order to force the banks or persuade the banks to become national banks, Congress puts a tax of 10% on any kind of bank notes issued by state banks, which drives them all out of existence. Because, now see, this is what's so weird about the money at this time. There's basically three kinds of money floating around. Gold and silver, greenbacks, that is money issued by the federal government, and banknotes issued by banks. Banks can issue money which circulate as real money, even though it's not legal tender. Well, now state banks can no longer issue money, and that's a part of the way they make money is by issuing money. So all these banks have to become national banks, or at least the ones who can afford to buy all of these federal bonds. Um, so by 1870, there's uh, two-thirds of the banks in the United States are national banks. They're chartered by the federal government, and they're, su and they're subject to the rules set down by the, by the federal government. So the national bank notes circulate as national currency just like the Green Bay. So it's a very complicated situation with money. Nowadays, there's just one, well, actually, that's not true. We got bitcoins. I don't know, is that money or not? <laughs> the, the IRS just announced it wasn't money, so I guess to, don't invest in it if you're thinking of doing that. 
But anyway, basic, and now we got credit cards and stuff, so we don't have to worry about that. But anyway, um, one of the results of this, first of all, the South is completely cut out of this financial system, right? There's no national banks being created in the South. This is a, they're in rebellion. The South comes back to the Union, and there's a new financial system that has been set up, which is completely under the control of Northern banking. And indeed, not just Northern banking, Wall Street banking. This is when Wall Street takes over the United States, or at least the banking sector of the United States. Because it's only the Wall Street banks that have the money to really become giant national banks. So the consolidation of fiscal power in Wall Street is tremendously enhanced by the Civil War. Again, that is not the cause of the Civil War. The Civil War is not caused because Wall Street bankers wanted to take over everything. But they figured out a way to do it while the war is going on. Because to finance the war, you've got to go where the money is, right? And the money was in these banks. And so they could help set the rules for what, when they gave money to the federal government. But the proliferation of currency out there actually it creates inflation, but it also actually helps to stimulate the economy. Credit is very easy to get. Uh, there's a lot of money floating around, and this, it actually stimulates economic growth. I mean, it's sort of like what the, the Federal Reserve Bank has been trying to do ever since the crisis of 2008. They've just been printing money, printing money for five, six years in order to try to stimulate the economy. And in an odd sort of way, that's what happened um, in the Civil War. But more than that, in the middle of the Civil War, the government also begins marketing these bonds to individual citizens, a, a, a new departure. They hire Jay Cook, a banker from uh, Philadelphia, who is very strategically located because his brother, Henry Cook, is a major Republican editor in Ohio and a friend of Salmon P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury. So, Cook gets this contract to sell federal bonds in small denominations to ordinary people. And he, and he launches a tremendous advertising blitz. He hires like 2,500 agents to go around the North. They print up leaflets and posters. And what is their slogan? Patriotism and profit. Patriotism and profit. Loan money to the government support the government, support the war effort, and make money doing so. And that's a pretty good combination. And they sell an enormous amount of these bonds uh, to ordinary people, not just these banks, but ordinary people buying the, buying the federal bonds. And Cook, who gets like a half of 1% uh, uh, commission, makes an enormous fortune out of this also. Um, but this is like a forerunner. It's almost really the beginning of modern advertising techniques in the United States, the marketing of the national bonds, not just to big financial institutions, but to ordinary people um, throughout the world. And it creates more patriotism, because if you own the bonds of the government, you have a vested interest in that government being strong and being able to pay you back. It creates a direct link and, uh, of self-interest between ordinary people and the, you know, the, the, the stability of the national government. 